I want to preach today from this third big picture sermon from this question, from this subject, big questions, big questions. I wanted to preach the big question, but our texts have several big questions that is asked of us. When you think and you look to see the big picture of life, the big picture of life produces big life questions. Amen. Questions that deal with this present time and questions that deal with eternity's past and eternity's future. Big questions. Bless us now, Lord, and may we do no damage to the word but preach that which become of sound doctrine and gospel in Jesus' name. Amen. Big questions. What shall we say to these things, these spiritual realities that we've been made aware of? These big questions that we have are designed today to put the onus on us. Amen. They will put the spotlight back on us. It will give us, put the responsibility on us, if you will. A big question is, what are we going to do with what we know. The believers are responsible. God bless the Facebook Live audience. Believers are responsible for what they know, for what we know. To him that knoweth his master's will, our Lord says, and doeth it not, he shall be beaten with few stripes. But he that knoweth and doeth is not shall be beaten with many stripes. He that doesn't know and fail to do will be beaten with few. We are responsible for what we, what we know. Amen. Uh, when, I, when I preach to you, the things I tell you shifts a degree of burden from me to you. Because now you know. When the parent has taught the child, when you've told them what to do or what not to do, once you know that they have been uh, told and taught and they got it, then the expectation rises. Because now... It's on them. Teach the child don't touch the stove. You teach them why not to touch the stove. You teach them what hot means. You go through every reason why they shouldn't touch the stove. And then the child touched the stove. You ask the child, why did you touch the stove? The onus was on you. Question is, what attitude will we assume? Or what position will we take after realizing these divine truths that caused Paul to come to the conclusion where he says to us, and we know that all things worketh together for good to them that love God. Paul talked about these truths. He asked the question, 
What are we going to say to these things? Now, if you look at verse 28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. It's not that all things are going to work out fine in the end. That's not what that passage means. It doesn't mean that all things are going to work out fine in the end for everyone. Nor does it mean that it will all come out in the wash eventually. Nor does it mean that God is going to sort out the mess of our lives and relieve us of the consequences of our sins eventually. Doesn't mean that. No, this passage, verse 28, I'm going to tell you something. In its application, is applied to a certain group of people. I'm going to go a little further. Risk um, heresy. It's applied to a certain group of believers. It's up, it is applicable only to them who, number one, love God. Hear me. Who love God. Amen. Of course, they're saved. It's not applied at all to sinners. But even among the saved, not every born again person loves God as they ought to. Word that love is the uh, Greek agapeo, which means it is the indication, listen to this, of the will. It's not filio. The filia. Love, filio, is when you fall in love with someone. You don't fall in love with the Lord. When the man fell in love with the woman, uh, oftentimes he falls for her at first sight. She looks like what he likes. Everybody has a preset silhouette in their mind of what pretty is. It varies with each person. Every man, he can't explain it, but he knows what pretty is to him. And every woman knows what handsome is to her in her mind and the people who appeal to you is the person who best fits that preset silhouette initially. Now you might learn some things about them later on to make you tap, to <laughs> break the whole silhouette and everything else. But you, you, if you fall for them, because there are things that you have in common with them. You know, once, once the initial uh, view, then there is the conversation. Then there is getting to know the person. Then there is seeing what you have in common. All those things make you fall in love. That's filial love. Well, unsaved man has nothing in common with God. God's holy. God's righteous. God is sinless. Amen. What is my point? To love the Lord requires a decision on your part. You, uh, and, and I tell you what it is. It's a decision 
to respond to his love. Because he's the initiator. Bible says we love him because he first loved us. All right? But it is an act of the will. You don't just fall in love with God. You choose to love God. This promise is to those who, who love God. Who choose to love God. Who will love God and who challenges all of the opposition that's in them to loving God. Like the flesh. We don't naturally love God in our flesh. The flesh don't want you to pray, fast, study the Bible. Bible is not the most interesting book uh, to read before you met, before you have come into the knowledge of Christ, and some of you since you've come into the knowledge of Christ. <laughs> Don't read the Bible as you are. It takes effort. Um, those of us who choose to love God above our own self-interest. Because sometimes loving God and following him will make you have to give up on some things that you felt were in your best interest. Yeah. Best interests, likes, personal preferences. We choose to love God over the cravings of our flesh. Choose to love God. I'm going to preach in a minute. There are desires that come up in us. That God says, you can't love me and fulfill this desire. Then you got to choose. See, to love God. To love God. Are you with me? Jesus said this about loving God in Matthew 22 and 37. He says, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. That is, love God with all of your courage, your awareness, and your understanding. Heart, soul, your body, and your mental capacity, your mind, your intellect. And when he was quoting that, he quoted that from the Shema of Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 5 that says, You shall love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul. And the Shema says, with all thy might. That is, with all your passion and uh, uh, intensity. Might. You love God in, we're in, a, in a, uh, a forceful love. And it says, thou shalt. It puts the onus on the individual. Well, what if I don't feel that way about the Lord naturally? None of us do. You go to work on that. Hallelujah. Initially, God is a required taste. Acquired taste. Excuse me. Acquired. And then after a while, you just love him. Concerning loving God, Jesus said this in Matthew's gospel, chapter 37, chapter 10, excuse me, verse 37 through 39. He that loveth father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. The cross of life is those things that we have to sacrifice to serve him. And what, what, what many are trying to do now is they're trying to just make the crosses that Jesus said we got to bear instead of giving stuff up and loving Jesus and following him. There are many churches now that says you can keep all that and still come in. 
You can stay a part of this club, that club, this group, that group, and all that, and, 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 and go to the club on Saturday night and do anything you want and still serve the Lord. Well, Jesus says, no, to be worthy of me, you got to choose me over those things. You got to love me enough to let those things go for me. I'm not getting an amen. Luke 14, 25 through 26 says, and, when, and, when, when, and there went great multitudes with him. And he turned and said to them, this is when Jesus had, I mean, uh, he had the crowd. Great crowds were gathering. And he turned and he said, I, I, I think I'll thin this crowd out a little bit. He turned and looked at the crowd and said, if any man come to me and hate not his father and his mother, his wife and his children, and brethren and sisters, Yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. He says, if you're going to follow me, you got to love me more than you love mom. Love me more than you love dad. Love me more than you love your brother or your sister. Love me more than you love yourself. If you don't love me to this degree, I see you following me, but hey, you cannot be my disciple. Loving God. That's not, a, that's not an empty statement to them that love God. To them that love God. Amen. Now the good thing is this. After choosing to love God, then you move to a place where you can't help but love him. Because your eyes come open. And you go then, you go from being a Psalms 73 and 2. To a Psalm 73 and 25. Psalm 70, 73 and 2 says, But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps was, had well not slipped. Psalm 73 and 25 says, Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon the earth that I desire besides thee. Oh, what growth uh, that took place between the second verse of Psalm 73 and the 25th verse. First big question that I have today to ask you is, do you love Jesus? Do you love God? Is, Psalm, is, is, is Romans 8 and 28 talking to you? I'm not talking about a passive, casual love. I'm not talking about a love that hasn't, cost you anything? I'm not, I'm not talking about a love that hasn't caused someone to walk away from you. Do you love the Lord? Do you love God? That's a big question. My next question is, what does your obedience say about your love for him? See, I tried to sing to y'all and get you happy. Because I knew what was coming. And I knew I would quiet you down a little bit, but I didn't think you'd be this quiet. I thought I'd get at least five to say I love the Lord. No, 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 no. That ain't real, see, because I had to ask for it. I'm playing, I'm playing. I know you're thinking, I know you're thinking. And it's designed, I want you to think. I'm, I'm, I, I know you love the Lord. I, I guess you love him. But what settles whether or not we love him is the degree of our obedience. Jesus said in John 14, John 14 and 15, if you love me, keep my commandment. And this same love is agapeo. If you love me by the act of the will, he says, keep my commandments. That is the proof of your love for me, your willingness to the degree that you keep my commandments. You know whether or not you're keeping his commandments. We all know whether we're keeping his commandments. For we know ourselves. We know whether we're keeping his commandments. 
Our Lord also said this in John 14 and 23. If a man love me, he will keep my words. This is for all of us, the young, the old, the middle aged, those who have been saved for a while, those who have just gotten saved. Amen. Do you love God? Do you have a deep passion for God? How often do you think about him through the day? Does he come to mind? What about at night? How many spontaneous, oh Jesus, I love you, love you, comes out of your mouth as you go about your busy day? And then when faced with decisions, when faced with decisions, what role does he play in that choice? These things speak to the depth of our love for God. Paul said all things work, work together for good to them that love God. Flu season has come. So... I'm going to try to, throughout all flu season, not ask you to shake your neighbor's hand. But I want you to look at your neighbor and ask them, do you love God? <laughs> Hallelujah. Do you love God? That's a big question. Do you love God? Our text not only applies to them that love God, but the text also applies to those of us who have a deep sense of call, of calling from the Lord, a call of God on our life, a summons, an invitation, a drawing. Not everybody have that. To serve the Lord. The passion. Not everyone is as passionate for Christ. You know that. You see it in the service. Some people sit there and never get happy. <laughs> Love can't be here. <laughs> you know I'm telling the truth. Whether it's legitimate love or illegitimate. It shows. But not only love, but a sense of calling. A calling. Can I get a witness? The Bible says that the promise is to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. Now, for the ultimate purpose of God, the ultimate purpose of God is revealed in Romans chapter 28 and verse 29, the B clause for us. And it is for us to be conformed to the image of his son. See that in verse 29? Second clause says, to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. In the beginning, the Godhead, we believe that there's one God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The God, God said to the Godhead, let us make man in our own image and after our own likeness and let us give them, let us give mankind and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Genesis 1 and 26. But man failed and became something considerably less than 
He was created. Man was created to be something. Made, praise the Lord, to live forever. Created to where he never need a flu shot. Cells that reproduce to the point that he would not die. Man was created, uh, Brother Robert. <laughs> he and I have the same problem. God made man initially. Man didn't have to deal with male pattern baldness. Isn't that right, Brother Fall? <laughs> Gave him dominion. There's a whole lot of men not understanding. You know? <laughs> oh, God. Oh, yeah. All this is part of the fall. The fall. You know, men ain't the only one that deal with things, but I'm going to move on. I'm going to move on, y'all. <laughs> yes, sir. And after man fell, a bad thing happened. God made man in his own image. I just read that. But then man, fallen man, began to produce men after his own image. Genesis 5 and 3 says, And Adam lived 130 years and begat sons in his own likeness after his image. By the time we get to Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5, God says, The thoughts and the imaginations of men's hearts are only evil continually. Look at the downward sparrow of the human race. Oh, look at what we get when we turn from the Lord. Genesis uh, uh, 5, chapter 6, excuse me, verse 5 says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And every imagination, every plan uh, of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth. And it grieved God's heart. Isn't that something? So this new fallen man, are you praying with me? This new fallen image of man was set, was at best a poverty stricken likeness of the original man. The original Adam was strong, full of color, full of life, full of vigor. What we got after the fall was. At best, by comparison, a man who had pneumonia or cancer or some flesh-wasting disease, the new image of man was wicked and fallen and frail and evil. Look at what happened in uh, Pittsburgh just yesterday. We're praying, we're praying, we're praying. We're praying. Amen. We saw that evil some 20 some odd years ago. At first, everybody in Raleigh criticized us because we, we've had security for years. And I did that because I wanted you to be able to come and have church in peace. Ain't nothing going to happen, but we'll have church and go home. That's all that's going to happen today. If anybody got any other thought, 
Forget it. You will never get out of here. Say amen. amen. And uh, it, it ain't the security you can see. Oh, I'm checked. We, we registered and everything. Everything, you know, it's, everything is right according to the law. Everything is right. Praise the Lord. We will come in here, and we, there ain't going to be no Dylan roof. We will come in here and have church, and, and we're going to go home afterwards. The new image. Bow with me just a few more minutes. Fallen man was a poverty stricken. You've seen people after they've been sick. You've seen them. They've, they, the clothes don't fit right. This was the new Adam and the new mankind. The, the, the new Eves and all of the new women uh, at their best look like sick persons compared to the original copy. The, the original Adam and Eve. Oh, and man was stricken and man continued in this vein until Christ. The Hebrew writer says this about Christ. Verse chapter one, verse three says, Jesus who being the brightness of God's glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself Jesus purged our sins and sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Now remember I just read to you if you're following me today Romans 8 and 29 the last clause tells us that, uh, that, that God uh, wants us to be conformed into the image of his son that he might be the firstborn of many brethren. That is the father's objective in sending Jesus was for Jesus to be the second man, Adam, to put us back to where we once were and then for all of us through Christ to follow and become Jesus is the firstborn and the rest of us now are walking in his footsteps. We are sons, praise the Lord, like Jesus was. The big question is tonight, today, do you feel a calling from the Lord for the loss? Be honest. Do you feel the need to share your faith? Who have you witnessed to lately? When you're at the grocery store, when you're at the convenience store, when you're at work, when you're in your neighborhood, when you're around your family members, does it cross your mind to share? Do, do you witness? The sad, the, sad, the sad truth is, for the overwhelming majority, the answer is no. The overwhelming majority of Christians today do not witness at all. We don't share the faith. And when we do talk with the lost about religious things, we take their position. They criticize the church, we criticize the church. They, they talk about who's not right. We talk about who's not right. They set the pace. When was the last time you vigorously, with excitement, shared Jesus or your own personal testimony about how the Lord rescued you with anybody? I mean, even with people who've heard it before. And many do not do this because they do not feel this calling. Not in you. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you something. I've learned you can preach it, you can teach it, you can talk it. But if a thing is not in a person, oh, if, it, if it's just not in them, 
and they're not willing to let the Lord put it in them, you will lose your joy trying to teach them how to have joy. So you just have to conclude they're joyless. And you go on. Amen. When was the last time you shared your faith? The promise of Romans 8 and 28 is only for those who deeply love God and who sense a strong invitation to help carry out God's good pleasure. Thank you, Jesus. Not, not many ministers, not many missionaries feel call, this calling to share their faith. Oh, you do a good job preparing your sermon for Tuesday night, and I'm glad. You do a great job preparing for the next time you'll stand here. And you should. But if that's the only preparation, if the only time, if the only time you feel the pull, the calling, the urge to share your faith, then Romans 8 and 28 is not talking to you. Not about you. It's not, it's not, it, it doesn't apply. God's purpose, hallelujah, or God's good pleasure is far grander than the alleviation of the unpleasantness of this life. It's far grander than God giving a promise of smooth sailing from now on. But God's good purpose for our lives is for us to be like Christ. Amen. God's promise is that all things would work together for good. All things. Let me unpack this and I'm getting ready to get out of here because you acted more like the first church of the Frigidaire <laughs> than upper room. All things here refer to spiritual realities. Verse 19 through 23 of chapter 8 of Romans speaks of the knowledge of the coming manifestation of the glorification of the sons of God. That is a spiritual reality that works for us. The hope and confidence in that promise that enables us to patiently wait for it. Verse 24 through 25. The fact that the Holy Spirit helps us pray. Verse 26 through 27. These spiritual realities cooperate with each other for our good. God works through these spiritual realities to fit our lives together so that we will in eternity look like Jesus. God works through these spiritual realities to bring out, bring us to the result of good. The end result is good. God has good things for us good things in this life and good things in the world to come. Good! That's what Christianity is about. It's about the Lord making us good. Bringing us to a good place. As you know, the, the promise of all things working together for good doesn't mean that you may not get sick. Because I know some dear Christians who have contended with cancers, contended with sickness, contend with death. The promise of good is not a promise that you will not have to contend with the vicissitudes of this life. But it is a promise, good God Almighty, that when God gets through with us, he brings us to a place called good and 
good means profitable or useful for his overall plan. And it could be that that sickness that you went through worked good in his overall plan because somebody saw you go through and souls were won and people began to look more like Jesus so then therefore what happened was good. Can I preach? Amen. Notice that at the end of the first day God called Everything that he made. Good. First day. Genesis 1 and 4. Praise the Lord. And the word good, that means good, pleasant, excellent, lovely, beautiful, delightful, correct, righteous, cheerful, happy, kind, morally good, financially good, in every way good. When God finished the first day, God looked at what he had, he had done, the things that he did, and God said it's good. And on the second day, Genesis 1 and 10, after gathering the waters, God looked again and God said that everything was good. Oh my, I don't want to be redundant, but after the third day, according to verse 12 of Genesis chapter 1, God called it good. Fourth day, verse 18, good. Thank you, Jesus. And then on the fifth day, Verse 21, the Lord looked at his work and he called it good. Then we get to the sixth day and after God made the female and brought her to the male and made man and did all this, God looked at all that he had made and God called it very good. Very good, meaning that it was entire. It was complete. It was whole. It was whole. Oh, let me tell you. Let me tell you what it means. Praise the Lord. Because see, in Genesis chapter 2, praise God. And that, 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 that very good with verse 31. But in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 1, we know that, that, that God rested. He rested uh, on the Sabbath. God rested. But Genesis 2 and 1 brings everything back to Genesis 1 and 1 status. See, in 1 and 1, everything was perfect. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Perfect. 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 And something happened to it. And the earth became, King James says, was. The earth became void and dark. Theologians call it Satan's flood. Something cataclysmic happened to change it. But when God got through restoring it, Genesis 2 and 1 says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And verse 2 says, And on the seventh day, God rested. He brought it back to being good. Now in our text, we see God using spiritual realities to bring us to a place called good. Hallelujah. Today, somebody ought to ask the Lord to work on them. Work on me, Jesus. Amen. Because I want to be conformed. I want to be in that place called good. There are things in me that are not the way they ought to be. So I need you, Lord, to begin to work on me. Can I get a witness? Work on me, Jesus, and make me better. Make me better. Bring me to the place that it is, that's called good. In our text, we... We see God working good for us. And the ultimate good is our conformity to Christ. How many still want to look like Jesus? How many still want to act like Jesus? More than you want that raise. More than you want the, to meet that goal. More than you want to 
do that project more than you want to do that thing that you want to do. How many want to be like Jesus? Lord, I need you to work on me. Work on me and work things out of me and bring me to that place called good. So my heart will be right and my spirit will be right. And, uh, and where I look like you, according to, and it's for them that are called, them that love God and called according to his purpose. Then he goes into eternity past. Verse 29, he says, for whom the Lord did foreknow. Let, let me say something here about the foreknowledge of God. Uh, you see, God knows everything. God knows everything. One of the things about God's foreknowledge is God knew us before we knew him. Foreknowledge, he knew me before, praise the Lord. He knew me before I knew him and before I gave my life to him, he knew me. And then he knew me before my mother and my father came together. You see, God knew me in eternity past. You see, he's been, he, God hadn't been God a long time. God's been God forever. And he will always be God. Always has been God. And always will be God. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is why I don't say that God is good all the time. Because long before God decided to make time, God was still good. I don't know at what point in eternity that God said to himself, I think I'll make me a world. I think I'll make me a universe. I do know that everything that exists, exists for his good pleasure. So at some point in eternity past, the Lord said it pleases me to make a universe and to put people on it. Hallelujah. And you know, when you start talking about God now, you're talking about an intelligence that's on such a level that we cannot comprehend. One of the things that gets us tripped up about God is that we try to figure God out with our little pea brains. But the smartest man cannot figure God out. The Bible says as far as the heavens are above the earth, so are his ways above our ways. And his thoughts are above our thoughts. He's way up there, oh Lord. And somewhere in eternity past, God knew me and God knew you. But let me back up a little bit here. Even God's foreknowledge, I like what Chambers said about the foreknowledge of God. He says nothing in the foreknowledge of God can deny the necessity for human responsibility and nothing that man can do will ever distract from the omnipotence of God. That is no matter what God knows we all have a part to play. He can reach out with his love but you can accept it or you can turn it down I'm so glad that when he reached out for me I said yes oh Lord but if I would have turned him down there's nothing that I can do that will catch God off guard because he is God and he knows everything how many know that he knows everything Good God Almighty, the Bible says he knows our down sittings and our uprisings, our thoughts from afar. Good God Almighty, when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said to the Father, Father, if thou be thy will, let this cup pass from me. But I heard some theologians say that Jesus looked in the cup, and when he looked in the cup, he saw me in the cup. He saw you in the cup. He saw our parents in the cup. He saw our souls in the cup. And Jesus said, if the only way this cup will pass is for me to drink it, then nevertheless not my will, but thy will be done. I'm so glad that he decided to drink from the cup 
For had he not drank from the cup, we'd all be lost. There ain't no way we would be conformed to the image of his son. We wouldn't be conformed physically and we wouldn't be conformed by faith. But Jesus, he paid it all and all to him we owe. If you're glad today that Jesus paid it all, would you say yes? Yes, Lord. For no has to do with God's for choice, has to do with God's ability to reach down from eternity past to determine before the foundation of the world certain things he knew. See, when Jesus died, that was not a backup plan. God doesn't have to have backup plans because God knows he chose us before the foundation of the world and then, then put free will in there that the choice would also be ours, but the choice is his. Hallelujah. This explains why there are some people who have a propensity. They are born in this world with a slant toward God. Nobody's born saved, but some of us, you have to admit, was born with a God conscious. When we got ready to lie, we felt funny. When we got ready to steal, we felt funny. Some of our other friends could go and smoke dope, do their thing, and some of you could, and you didn't feel a thing. But that was others, others of us who said, I'm scared to do it. God might get me. The devil might get me. And as soon as we heard the message of salvation, it was easy for us. We just got saved the first time we heard it. And then there are others. After the 1,000th time, they finally came around. All of these things are in the foreknowledge of God. I'm glad he knew me before I knew him. Can you say yeah? Yeah! Yeah, Lord! Are you glad today that he had you on his mind even before you were born? Are you glad today that he had you in his heart even before your mama gave birth to you? Somebody said thank you. Somebody said thank you. Give him praise for his foreknowledge. Yeah! Yeah, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Whom he foreknew, he did predestine. To prede predestine is to define in advance, to define the limits in advance. And the best way for me to explain this, God bless. One day I'll use you for an example. You were my executive administrator for 16 years. That office right there was the administrator's office. When you resigned and moved on to other things, I then I sent out the word. I needed an, an administrator. Five women applied. Thank you, Jesus. I didn't know who would get it. But here's what I predestined, that whoever got it, they would be in that office, that same place, because that's the space that was predetermined. It was predetermined before the lot fell on Patricia. She didn't have to go and find a new office space because I, I had already determined that's where to be. Well, God predetermined that those of us who accept him would be holy, would be real, would be saved, would be molded into the image of his son. Somebody lift your hands and thank God for his predestination. He predetermined that you'd have joy. He predetermined the good God Almighty that he would pick you up, turn you around. He predetermined that if you accept me, I'll cause all things to work together for your good. Oh, Lord, thank you, Jesus. 
somebody praise him if you understand what I'm saying yeah yeah Lord Woo! you want to give somebody a fist bump and tell them this thing is fixed this thing was fixed good God almighty see these are spiritual realities this is a part of the good even before you got saved look at the good that was set in place hallelujah the bible teaches and whom he foreknow foreknew he predestined that they would be shaped into the image of his son so y'all stop trying to be worldly christians stop trying to be christians that look like the devil stop trying to be christians who look like the world stop trying to be christians who look like rock stars stop trying to be christians who look like rappers he predetermined that if you get saved you would look like me you look like jesus you look like somebody he'd beautify you yeah yeah lord Somebody praise him to the top of your voice. Ah, yeah! And uh, I'll spend some more time on this the next time. But he said now, whom he, prede- he predetermined, he predestinated to be conformed into the image of his son, that Jesus might be first. And then walking behind him, a long line of believers who look just like him. Why like him? Because he looked like Genesis chapter 1 when God made everything good. And he's determined to bring everything back to the way he made it. For he was pleased when things were good. And we're made for his good pleasure. So if we're not good, he's not pleased. So he's working it back. Bringing things back to good. Are you with me? To good. Now listen, listen to this. And uh, and moreover, whom he did predestinate. Them he summoned. He invited. He invited. He invited. Now he's invited everybody. He invited. Look at this. And whom he called. And this call, one writer said, it is called with the intention, with the expectation that the answer, that the call was answered. So the called here means those who said yes. This call is not those of you who hear the gospel today and you, well, I'm not quite ready yet, but the Lord is calling me. You're not the call. The called are the ones who said yes. I'm, I've said, how many have said yes in here? I've said yes. I've said yes to the Lord. I'm part of the call. And then he says, and this is what's so beautiful. Even though we're working it out, We're living it out. We're living it out. We're growing, right? We're living it out. We're working on ourselves, working on our shortcomings. We're working it out. Here's what's so wonderful. The called who says yes, who is sincere, he has already justified Hallelujah. That's why the Bible says, who is he that will lay any charge to God's elect? After you finish pointing at him, God says they're justified in his sight. Isn't that something? Because if you notice, that's written in past tense. Whom he called, he justified. 
Oh, oh, hey, all this determined in eternity past. And now this, I remember I said, it, it doesn't mean that we don't have to deal with the consequences for our actions. But on a spiritual plane, we stand here today. If I died right now, I'd go to heaven. Amen. Say, so if, if you died right now, you ain't got to go find 10 people and, and get it right if you're born again. And you're saved by grace. You're already, from a spiritual standpoint, holiness people struggle with this. They struggle with it because uh, sometimes we are borderline legalists. And the reason why it, we, we're borderline legalists, we're afraid that if a person realizes that they're already justified, then they, they'll walk away thinking, well, I can send up a storm and nothing will happen to me now that I'm justified. But here's the problem with that. People who are justified don't think that way. See, that, that doesn't cross the justified person's mind. The justified person in reality thinks just the opposite. When you realize what the Lord have done, you go, what? Oh, I got to earn this. I got to live up to this. You mean to tell me that Jesus did all these things and predetermined all this before I met him. And I walk in Day one, from a spiritual standpoint, justified. That means, that's a legal term. Free. That means all the charges drop. That's a, that's a justified. That's a legal term. Am I right, Your Honor? Justified. Praise the Lord. Justified. And, and then he says, and to them whom he justified. Past tense. Them he glorified. You know what the Lord sees when he looks at us through the blood of Jesus, the blood shed on our lives? He sees us looking like the first man, Adam, and the first woman, Eve, whom he called good. Very good. Not the frail humans that we actually are, but through his blood. Good. Hallelujah. So my last question is, after realizing all of these spiritual realities, the coming glorification, the role that hope plays, the spirit helping our infirmities, right? Then, the, the fact that he foreknew, predestined, justified, and glorified us. Paul said, learn all these things. Last big question for today is, what shall we say to these things? What do you say? What is our response? What attitude, what, what frame of mind, having learned all of this, having learned how fixed this thing is, what do we say? And then he didn't, leave, he didn't even leave it up to us to answer it because we might have got that wrong. He answered it. If God be for us. And the word if there is not if as in a question. But it's literally since God is for us. And he's got to be for us for he foreknew, predestined, justified, glorified us. Then with all of that, all these spiritual realities being true, what do we say to these things? We say if God be for us, who can be against us? And the answer is nobody. Hallelujah. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. For what, with what Jesus has done, there is nothing that Satan can do 
to undo the things that the Lord has done. Unless you let him. And ain't no way in this world you're going to be that crazy. Oh, no. Oh, God. I think, I, I think, as I close the book today, I think that I will respond to these spiritual realities the only way that makes sense. The only sensible response, the only sensible, sensible response is that of Dad Mason's response. Yes, Lord. There's nothing else left to tell him. Yes. Yes, Lord. Yes. And of course, thank you. Glory to God. If you were listening to me today, you learned something. You learned that this thing is already, everything's in your favor. That no matter what the enemy would try to do, just wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. It comes out in your favor. See, some of these deeper realities are, they're difficult to preach. But I hope you got it. You just hang in there. You hang in there. I feel led today to open the altar a different way. I feel led today to pray for everybody. I'll tell you something. Somebody said today to themselves, I'm going to love God more. I, I, I've been leaving my love for God in the case of our, so our thing. If it grow, it grow. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Now I realize that if I concentrate on him, if I put forth a greater effort, if I love the things of God more. See, when you fall in love with the Lord, you fall in love with the things of God. A lot of believers don't love church. They view church as a problem. Church is the ch chore. Church is in the way. We constantly contend with these notions. Jesus died to establish the church. He said, upon this rock I will build my church. And yet, many of us Love the Lord, but we constantly complain about church. We have, we have our inheritance among them that are sanctified. And many of us love the Lord, but we have a bigger problem with the sanctified than we do with the lost. I've heard Christians say, I get along better with unsaved people than I do saved people. And every, and every time I hear that, I say to myself, somebody needs to be saved. Because there's no way in this world, there's no way in this world you will have more in common with a lost individual than you have in common with somebody who knows the Lord. Glory to God. A deep sense of calling. Saints, they're not all limited to being called into the ministry. Everybody is not going to be called into the ministry. I wonder if some of them who have been called have been called. Because you, you call, but you won't work. You call, but you, I can't get you. The only thing you're excited about doing is preaching. But a true calling gives you an excitement for every aspect of the work of the Lord. Some of us Hadn't been called, we ain't been called to preach, we called to be the star. Pastor, I just see myself doing what you're doing. 
No, you're called to see yourself doing what God has you doing. Say amen. I got three amens then. The work of... <laughs> the, work, the, work, the work of the Lord. My son-in-law said, I was one of them. The work of the Lord is something that we've got to fall in love with. In love with God. In love with the things of God. Hallelujah. I talk to Christians. I tell them about how babies are being slaughtered. And they feel nothing. You know what they do in many cases? They pivot. I tell us all this is going on. And listen, if you've had an abortion, I'm not talking to you. You know, when you when you talk about these things, because it's so prevalent in our community, it'll empty your roles. Sometimes people don't come back anymore because they don't want to hear that. It hurts them. It brings up painful things. You got to let the Lord forgive you. See, you got to let the Lord forgive you. And then, and then you don't want to penalize the preacher who talk about it because if you're forgiven, you're forgiven. You are justified. It's like it never happened. But if we don't talk about it, we're going to keep losing our numbers. And the reason we have a border problem, border, an immigration problem, is because the two major parties see a replacement for us. And I'm one of the few who's brave enough to tell you. The Democrats with these illegals see, see votes. We'll get them in the country, we'll give them free stuff, and they'll vote for us and keep us in office. The Republicans see cheap labor. We can bring them in because y'all charge too much now. You, you want to get paid like everybody, everybody else. So we can bring them in and pay, uh, pay them a substantial drive uh, wages down. And the only person they, right now, the only person who is fighting both sides on this issue is the current president. He got just as many Democrats, uh, Republicans who don't want it, who don't like it when he say we're not going to let them in. He got just as many Republicans who dislike that as he has Democrats because they want what they want. Oh, I'm telling you something. I'm I'm I'm, I'm prophesying now on a on a on a national level. Well what, well, what will happen to us? They want to keep us aborting our children. So you keep, you just, you, we, we want you to love us and keep us in power and we'll keep talking to you about a woman's right to choose and we will talk you in. We'll make it easy and convenient for you to make that choice. And if, and if we can keep you doing it 2,000 times approximately per day, long enough, that won't be enough of you around to matter anyway. That's the game. That's the game. That, cut, that Kavanaugh, all that stuff you saw, that was about one thing. One thing. It wasn't about no, he might have groped a girl 36 years ago. There ain't one man in here want to be called on trial for anything 36 years ago. I just, look, 36 years, guilt! <laughs> 40, 40 years ago, I did it. You know, it's gonna be a short, a short, a short court case here. <laughs> now, I, ain't, I ain't killed nobody, and I ain't been with no man. Anything else, you know, probably. 
I mean, it's more likely than not, because, you know, back when I was in school, high school in the 70s, the thing was to, you know, get a feel. I mean, I mean, I mean, you wasn't even, you wasn't even considered a man. You know, oh, yeah, I, I like you don't even know, bam! But all that was about, somebody laughing at me, was so that the slaughter of the unborn can continue. Be justified. Don't punish the preacher. I know when we preach these tough truths, that you have choices with other churches you can go to where you can be a capper, a zapper, a, a eastern star, a western star. You can be in the fraternity. You can be a mason. You can be everything. I already know. You go right around there and be right there and be right at home and still love the Lord. You get up and sing in uh, skin tight leggings and everything else. And, 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 and ain't nobody bothered by it. But that's not being conformed to the image of Christ. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for myself. I want to pray for conformity to the image of Christ. I want to pray for those on Facebook that we all be conformed to the image of Christ. Shape me, Lord. Make me. Being conformed is being molded. Amen. I want to become in the earthly realm who and what I am in the spiritual realm. I was talking to my grandson the other day and I said to him, you are, matter of fact, to John Patrick and to Pamela, I said, you are Amanchukus. That's your family name. You are my grandchildren. I'm your grandfather. Because you are of a certain name and of a certain family, you don't do certain things. Now, the goal now is for them to live up to being in the natural, what they were born into because you're their father. Well, we've been born again. See, and when you've been born again, now we want to live up to in the natural, glory to God, who we are in this spirit.